Stupid Corporate Decisions number one. HBO had the opportunity to air The Walking Dead, but passed. Apparently, they thought it was too violent. <laughs> Welcome to Film Theory, where we always recommend the Double Tap. So let's talk The Walking Dead. In a world where zombies are everywhere, AMC's The Walking Dead is the big boy on the playground. The most popular piece of zombie-related media in the last decade. Except not. They're not zombies, they're walkers. Walker. Or biters. Biters? I always thought that was weird, but in researching this episode, I found that according to the series creator, Walking Dead takes place in a universe where the concept of zombies doesn't exist in the pop culture lexicon. Hence the characters having to learn about things like attacking the brain. Well, it's good for them, I guess. It means they live in a universe where Uva Bowl's House of the Dead doesn't exist. On the flip side, though, their insistence on calling them walkers now forces me to sarcastically replace all zombie pictures throughout this episode with pictures of tennis ball-laden nursing home equipment and Chuck Norris Texas Rangers. Ranger, the original walker. But there's always been one other thing that's bothered me since early on in the show. And no, it's not the way Rick pronounces thangs. Anything, anything, everything. Or Carl. I mean, uh, Carl. It's the fact that by the end of season one, all of our main characters are killing machines. Deadly warriors who are always on high alert because if they let their guard down for a second, they could be mincemeat for some zombified or biterified creature. They've survived this long because, well, survival is their talent. But despite all of this, zombies still somehow are able to sneak up on them regularly. That is absurd. These are zombies, not solid snake. But it did get me thinking. Our heroes can't seriously be snuck up on that often, can they? How can they be so simultaneously badass, yet still get into these absurd situations with walkers that move at a snail's pace, sneaking up and surprising them? Is it just some lazy writing? An easy way to create tension where, realistically, there probably shouldn't be any? Probably yes. But here on Film Theory, we try to explain away those logical inconsistencies with the help of science. And today, loyal theorists, I think there's actually something very wrong with our lovable, ragtag motley crew of survivors. Something with a perfectly sound scientific explanation. I think they're all losing their hearing. No, I get it. That's a bit of a weird thing to say, right? Hearing loss? Well, first, let me explain how noise-induced hearing loss works. It should come as no surprise, but very loud sounds can damage the internal workings of the ear. Sound is measured in decibels, and generally speaking, anything below 75 decibels is safe to hear pretty much constantly. However, once you start getting above 85 decibels, you get into the range where the sound you hear can potentially damage one's hearing and cause permanent hearing loss. Once you get over 120 decibels, you actually actually start to feel pain. The louder the sound, the shorter amount of time it takes to do the damage. Now, that 85 decibel threshold of danger might sound like it's a really high number, but it's not. A normal conversation is usually around 60 decibels. Heavy city traffic is 85. Markiplier's reaction to a FNAF jump scare? Probably around 100, depending on the volume of your headphones. A passing motorcycle, a concert, your MP3 player at max volume, all well above 85. And the decibel record recording system is weighted in a pretty unique way, so that in that last example, an iPod turned up all the way actually averages at roughly 105 decibels, which would be 100 times more intense than a sound at 85 decibels. So that's all well and good, but how does it all work? Well, when a noise travels into the ear, it vibrates the eardrum and several tiny bones, which amplify the sound as it enters the inner ear, otherwise known as the cochlea. Here, small hairs are attached to nerve cells. These hairs ride the waves of these vibrations, creating electrical signals signals that travel from our auditory nerves into the brain. We are then able to translate the signals into sounds we can recognize and understand. The sheer force of the vibrations created by sounds louder than 85 dB run the risk of destroying these little hairs, and once they're damaged or destroyed, they don't grow back. The hearing loss is permanent. So what does any of this have to do 
with The Walking Dead. Well, consider this. Guns are loud. Incredibly loud. And the survivors often shoot them in positions where the guns are right next to their ears. Oftentimes in firing squad formation or right next to their faces. Just watch a Rick Grimes kill compilation. It's incredible. Up through March of this year, Rick alone had killed 154 things throughout the five seasons. Humans and walkers alike. And the vast vast majority of those are gun kills with Rick firing wildly into crowds of zombies like it's left for dead. So those are bad enough, but then there are the creative kills where the gun is right up against the ear. Like in season two when Rick gets stuck under two walkers he just killed and has to do this cool move where he shoots a walker through the mouth of another walker. The gun is inches from his ear. They actually play with the idea of the sound of guns hurting your ears in season four when Rick headbutts a man holding a gun to his head. The man fires the gun by accident right next to Rick ear and Rick hears ringing for several seconds. But this, I think, is my favorite, where Rick literally turns his ear into the gun before he shoots it. Look, Andrew Lincoln, I get it. I know you're conveying some painful emotions here, but your character is going to be dealing with some painful emotional ear damage when you do that. Again, there are more instances of this than would be interesting to count in this video, but you can already start to see how the survivors are putting their hearing in danger. But just how far gone are they? Let's find out. Our favorite sheriff turned walker slayer's gun of choice is the Colt Python 357 Magnum, which, when shot, has been measured to be as loud as 164 decibels. Just to give you a frame of reference, that's over a hundred times more powerful than a jet engine, which is rated at 140 dB. A hundred times! And he's firing this thing off like it's Christmas! There are countless different types of 9mm pistols used in the show, from Glocks to Ladysmiths to Brown high powers, all of which measure in the 160 dB range. Shotguns are also a frequent weapon of choice, including several different types of 12 and 20 gauge varieties, clocking in at 150 decibels or so. Dale's 308 Remington 700, 156 dB. Long story short, just looking at these numbers, we can see that all of them get above both the threshold of danger and the threshold of pain. So, you know, we're dealing with some pretty powerful sound. And it gets worse. A lot of the time, the survivor are shooting in small, echoey, enclosed spaces. I mean, they spent two entire seasons and had countless firefights in a prison. As early as episode one, Rick gets stuck under a tank and kills off five walkers. And this makes things much much worse for them. You see, sound acts as a wave and can bounce off of walls, creating echoes. That's why I record these episodes in my closet. The clothes absorb sound, so it sounds like I'm right up against you and talking into your ear. Can you hear me now? I'm talking up into your ear. I love you, I love you, I love you. I'm getting all up in you right now. But without any padding to absorb the sound, it bounces until it eventually dissipates. With each bounce, those tiny hairs in your ears are getting smacked with another wave. And when you're dealing with sounds as loud as gunshots, each of those waves is creating huge amounts of damage. Sure, when a sound echoes, it generally tends to become about 40% weaker. But at this high of dB level, in such close proximity to your ears, it's gonna be very, very bad for our survivors hearing. Like, say, that tank I mentioned. It's very likely that Rick would have had his hearing permanently damaged in the first hours of the series when he killed the walkers under the tank and in the tank with him. Sure, they do show Rick in pain after the encounter, the sound of the gunshot completely disorienting him, but then they promptly forget about this and have him talk in a walkie-talkie a couple seconds later. This is something that happens time and time and time again on this series, and sound damage has a cumulative effect. Well, one bad blast can have you lose your hearing permanently, see also Archer and his tinnitus, more often each concussion your ear has to deal with adds on to all the other ones that came before, meaning that with each shot, each creative kill, the survivors are becoming more and more deaf, more and more susceptible to a walker sneak attack. Now, I can already hear you saying, but Matt Pat, what about soldiers? They're in firefights at least semi-frequently, but they're not all deaf. And yeah, that's true, but there's a key difference. The military uses hearing protection. Allow me to introduce you to the combat arms ear plug. These things are pretty cool, with two sides that offer two different types of protection. The yellow sides allow you to hear conversations, but protect slightly against high-pitched banging and snapping, while the brown sides offer complete hearing protection. And even with this preventative action, there have been reports of hearing loss or ringing in ears being a serious problem for soldiers returning home from war. And it's not just from Iraq or Afghanistan, it's been a problem since World War II. So with the amount that they shoot guns and how often the guns are close to their faces, most of the survivors 
really are putting their lives at risk. It also explains why Rick has to shout literally non-stop to find Coral. I, I mean Carl. But there's one more cool part to this theory, Daryl and Michonne. Since they were introduced, these characters have been fan favorites, mostly because of their really cool weapons of choice, the crossbow and the katana. But now you have another reason to respect these machines of Walker Death. Not only are they super effective and reusable weapons, but they're also practically silent, which means they're gonna be a lot more effective in the series for a lot longer. Daryl isn't deadly simply because of his aim and tracking skills, it's because he's protecting one of his most valuable survival senses, his hearing. Okay, yeah, sure, he rides around on a motorcycle, which is above the threshold of danger, but no one's perfect, okay? In a post-apocalypse, you gotta do what you gotta do. Long story short, with how much they shoot guns and how often they're in enclosed spaces while shooting, I'm surprised that any characters on the show can hear anything anymore, let alone all the loud, sputtering zombies that seem to sneak up with them with remarkable ease. I guess the survivors of The Walking Dead should more accurately be called The Walking Deaf. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut. <laughs> Attention anime fans, today we're taking a poll. Which series would you like to see covered on a future episode of Film Theory? Full Metal Alchemist or Sword Art Online? Click on one to choose to cast your vote. In the meantime though, if you watch The Walking Dead, you must like zombies. If so, check out my video on history's most famous zombie, Frankenstein's Monster, and how Dr. Frankenstein could indeed bring the dead back to life using modern science by clicking right here. And really, that's about it. So now if you'll excuse me, I've... Gotta go, gotta go, work on my next theory. Yeah, we're tackling that one. Get ready.